Pursuant to the Constitution and according to the law, I hereby call to order the House of Representatives for the first regular session of the 72nd General Assembly of the State of Colorado. Will all those present in the chamber please stand, you are already standing, uh, <laughs> for the presentation of the colors by the Colorado Honor Guard. Please remain standing while the colors are posted.
please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you to all of our guests who are here today. You may be seated. I would like to thank the members of the Colorado Guard from the Colorado National Guard who presented the colors this morning. I would also like to thank Leo and Ryder Kunkel and Owen and Van Casey, the young men who led us in the Pledge of Allegiance. They are the sons and nephews of Representative Casey Becker and her husband, Miles Kunkel, soon to be Speaker of the House. On behalf of the entire House, I would like to introduce David Starry and Megan Pryor, who are voice students in the University of Colorado Boulder College of Music. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and your beautiful voices this morning. At this time, we have some legislative business to take care of. If there is no objection pursuant to House Rule 2, Marilyn Eddins will be elected as Chief Clerk for the time being. was clearly no objection and <laughs> and I am especially grateful for being able to have the opportunity to work with the chief clerk Marilyn so closely these last several years and as some of you may know I had to pass over my parking pass to representative elect Valdez and so I had nowhere to park this morning and luckily Marilyn got me a parking spot so thank you so very very much for that it's never fun being a lame duck speaker right speaker McNulty <laughs> <laughs> Representative Janelle, House District 52 has resigned her seat in the Colorado House of Representatives. She will continue her service to the state in the Colorado Senate. If there is no objection, Representative Janelle's resignation letter will now be read at length and it, it will be it will not be read at length and it will <laughs> be printed in today's journal. Anybody want to hear that letter at length? All right, seeing no objection, uh, we will proceed. Communications from Secretary of State. The Secretary of State's office has delivered the certification of the abstract of votes cast in the general election for all candidates for the Colorado House of Representatives for the 72nd General Assembly. If there is no objection, the abstract of votes cast for all candidates will not be read at length as it will be printed in full in the journal. Seeing no objection, we will proceed. The Secretary of State's office has also delivered the certification of the abstract of votes cast for the members of the Colorado State House of Representatives as duly elected by the qualified electors of the state of Colorado. Mr. Randall, please read the certification from the Secretary of State of the duly elected representatives. State of Colorado, Department of State, I, Wayne W. Williams, Secretary of State of the State of Colorado certify that I have canvassed the abstract of votes cast submitted in the State of Colorado and do state that to the best of my knowledge and belief, the persons listed on the attached list were duly elected to the Office of Colorado State House of Representatives by the qualified electors of the State of Colorado in the November 6, 2018 general election. In testimony whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the great seal of the State of Colorado at the City of Denver this 11th day of December, 2018. Signed, Wayne W. Williams, Secretary of State. State Representatives, District 1, Susan Lontine. District 2, Alec Garnett. District 3, Jeff Bridges. District 4, Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez. District 5, 
Alex Valdez. District 6, Chris Hansen. District 7, James Rashad Coleman. District 8, Leslie Herod. District 9, Emily Sirota. District 10, Edie Hooten. District 11, Jonathan Singer. District 12, Sonia Harquez Lewis. District 13, Casey Becker. District 14, Shane Sandridge. District 15, Dave Williams. District 16, Larry G. Liston. District 17, Thomas Tony Exum Sr. District 18, Mark A. Snyder. District 19, Tim Geithner. District 20, Terry Carver. District 21, Lois Landgraf. District 22, Colin Larson. District 23, Chris Kennedy. District 24, Monica Duran. District 25, Lisa A. Cutter. District 26, Dylan Roberts. District 27, Brianna Tatone. Brianna Tatone. District 28, Carrie Tipper. District 29, Tracy Kraft Tharp. District 30, Daphna Michelson Janae. District 31, Yadira Caraveo. District 32, Adrian Benavides. District 33, Matt Gray. District 34, Kyle Mullica. District 35, Shannon Bird. District 36, Mike Weissman. District 37, Tom Sullivan. District 38, Susan Beckman. District 39, Mark Baisley. District 40, Janet Buckner. District 41, Jovan Melton. District 42, Dominique Jackson. District 43, Kevin Van Winkle. District 44, Kim Ransom. District 45, Patrick Neville. District 46, Denea Escar. District 47, Bree Buenteo. District 48, Stephen Allen Humphrey. District 49, Perry L. Buck. District 50, Rochelle Galindo. District 51, Hugh McKean. District 52, Joanne Janal. District 53, Jenny Arndt. District 54, Matt Soper. District 55, Janice Rich. District 56, Rod Bockenfeld. District 57, Bob Rankin. District 58, Mark Catlin. District 59, Barbara McLaughlin. District 60, James D. Jim Wilson. District 61, Julie McCluskey. District 62, Donald E. Valdez. District 63, Lori A. Sane. District 64, Kimmy Lewis. District 65, Rod Pelton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you, too. I move that a Committee on Credentials be appointed. The question before the House is appointment of the Committee on Credentials. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. That motion passes. Representatives, Majority Leader Garnett, Chairman, Representative Kennedy, and Minority Leader Neville will serve as a Committee on Credentials. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Committee on Credentials will meet in Room 112 in a few minutes. All right, we will take a brief recess um, so the committee can meet in Room 271. Oh, it was 112. 112, that must have been changed, 112. <laughs>
Come back to order. All right, we will come back to order. Majority Leader Garnett. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The Committee on Credentials has met and has made its report. I requ request the report uh, be read. All right, Mr. Randall will read the report from the Credentials Committee. The Committee on Credentials has made examination of the report of the Secretary of State and received testimony and other materials, and it hereby finds as follows. That the list of representatives elected at the general election held on November 6th, 2018, as certified by the Secretary of State of the State of Colorado, is a true, complete, and authentic list of all representatives elected at said general election for the term provided by law, and said persons do truly possess the constitutional and statutory qualifications and are entitled to membership in this body as aforesaid pursuant to law in such case made and provided. That a vacancy currently exists in House District 52 and that such vacancy shall be filled, file, filled upon certification by the Secretary of State of the name of the person duly elected or appointed to fill the vacancy pursuant to law. Signed, Majority Leader Alec Garnett, Chairman, Assistant Majority Leader Kennedy, Minority Leader Neville. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the adoption of the report of the Committee on Credentials. The question is the adoption of the report of the Committee on Credentials. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. All of those opposed signify by saying no. The Credentials Committee report is adopted. <laughs> Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that a committee of three be appointed to wait upon Chief Justice Nathan B. Coates and request him to administer the oath of office to the representatives elect. All right, seeing no objection, uh, Representatives Don Valdez will serve as chair. Uh, Representative Alex Sirota and Representative Lewis are appointed to wait upon the Chief Justice. The House will be at ease. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House stand in recess until Chief Justice Coates is available. All right, seeing no objection, the House will stand in recess.
Everyone, please be seated. The House will come back to order. Chief Sergeant at Arms, Judson.
All those certified for membership in the House of Representatives, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Colorado and that I will faithfully perform the duties of my office to the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. Congratulations. Congratulations to you all. Thank you, Chief Justice Coates. The House will be in a recess while the committee escorts the Chief Justice from the chamber. The House will come back to order. The House will come back to order for the moment you've all been waiting for. Mr. Randall, please call the roll. Representatives, Arndt. Here. Baisley. Here. Beckman. Here. Benavidez. Bird. Bockenfeld. Bridges, Buck, Buckner, Buenteo, Caraveo, Carver, Catlin, Coleman, Cutter, Duran, Escar. Exum, Galindo, Garnett, Geithner, Gonzalez Gutierrez, Gray, Hansen, Herod, Putin, Humphrey, Jackson. Here. Harkes Lewis. Here. Kennedy. Here. Kraft Tharp. Yes. Landgraf. Here. Larson. Here. Lewis. Here. Liston. Here. Lontine. Here. McCluskey. McKean, Here. McLaughlin, Melton, Michelson Janae, Molica, Here. Neville, Here. Pelton, 
Rankin. Here. Ransom. Here. Rich. Here. Roberts. Here. Sane. Present. Sandridge. Here. Singer. Here. Sirota. Present. Snyder. Here. Soper. Here. Sullivan. Tipper. Here. Tatone. Here. Valdez A. Here. Valdez D. Good morning, Colorado! <laughs> Van Winkle. Weissman. Here. Williams. Here. Wilson. Here. Madam Speaker. time and due time my dear I am present <laughs> nominations for oh we got 64 present and one vacancy and so there is a quorum majority leader Garnett Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is my honor to nominate Representative Casey Becker for Speaker of the House of Representatives convening in the 72nd General Assembly. Minority Leader Neville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I second the nomination of Representative Casey Becker for Speaker of the Colorado House of Representatives. All right, properly moved and seconded. Are there any further nominations? Seeing none, Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the nominations be closed and that a unanimous vote be cast for Representative Casey Becker as Speaker of the Colorado House of Representatives for the 72nd General Assembly. Seeing no objection, the nominations are closed. The question before the House is that Representative Casey Becker be elected as Speaker of the Colorado House of Representatives for the 72nd General Assembly. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All of those opposed signify by saying no. The record will reflect that Representative Casey Becker has been unanimously elected as the Speaker of the House of Representatives for the 72nd General Assembly. Congratulations, Madam Speaker Casey Becker. Today is a very exciting day because I think this legislative body is the most inclusive that we have ever seen in the state and likely the country. When I came into this role, there was a gift that Speaker Bledsoe had left years ago. He served in 1981, uh, the year after I was born. And it is a statute of a cowboy. And it has, for generations, went from different speakers to members of leadership. And today, I want to leave a gift to Speaker Casey Becker and also the leadership and all the future leadership for generations to come. And that is a statute. Of a Native American woman. Because the Native 
American story is part of our American story and our Western heritage as well. And so I'm going to give this to you. I'm not going to make you hold it right now because <laughs> it is pretty heavy. Um, but I also want to say this before I leave this podium, that we are living in a moment in time where it is not a time to be shy or to be bashful, but it is a time to be bold, to problem solve for all Coloradans. But it is also a time to begin to heal some of the divisions that can divide us at times. And I hope that this body, under the leadership of Speaker Becker, will never miss an opportunity to problem solve for all Coloradans, because there is more that will bind us together than will ever divide us. And I have known Speaker Becker for a very, very long time. We have worked together, and she is a strong and dedicated public servant. So as I leave, I want to leave the words of the Talmud, which is this. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, and walk humbly now. Congratulations, Speaker Casey Becker. Thank you so much, Speaker Duran. My good wishes go with you as the new speaker. It's a big job, but I know you will have the support of your... <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I only hope I can fill the shoes of all who came before me. Thank you for your service to the General Assembly and to Colorado. And thank you all for your vote of confidence. Before the minority leader and I address the body, we must adopt the organizational resolutions setting the temporary House rules and joint rules of the House and Senate. We will also adopt a resolution setting a joint session to certify the votes for certain state elected officials. These resolutions have been printed and are in your files and accessible on your iPads. We will then notify the Senate and the governor that we are organized and ready to go to work. So we will start. Yep. Introduction of, re of resolution, Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I move that the rules be suspended and House Resolution 1001 be given immediate consideration. Uh, members, House Resolution 1001 is adopting the temporary House rules of the 71st General Assembly as the temporary rules of the 72nd General Assembly. House Resolution 1001 concerning the temporary rules of the House of Representatives. The question before the House is to suspend the rules for immediate consideration of HR 1001. All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion is passed. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that House Resolution 1001 be adopted. Seeing no discussion, the question before the House is the adoption of HR 1001. All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. HR 1001 is adopted. Uh, okay. Um, message from the Senate. Okay. You guys are not, we're not there yet. I'll just hang we'll tight. We'll take a seat. Just, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> 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 
Madam Speaker, the Senate has adopted Senate Joint Resolution 1 and transmits herewith. Introduction of resolution. Majority Leader Garnett. Oh. Mr. Randall. Senate Joint Resolution 1 by Senator Femberg, also Representative Garnett, concerning the adoption of the joint rules as the temporary joint rules of the 72nd General Assembly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the rules be suspended and Senate Joint Resolution 1 be given immediate consideration. Members, this is a resolution adopting the temporary joint rules of the 71st General Assembly as the temporary joint rules for the 72nd General Assembly. The question before the House is to suspend the rules for immediate consideration of SJR 1. All of those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion is passed. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that SJR 1 be adopted. Seeing no discussion, the question before the House is the adoption of SJR 1. All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. SJR is adopted. Mr. Randall, please open the machine for co-sponsors. Okay. This is like the only, That's, but it wasn't already green. It should have been already green. Please close the machine. Introduction of resolution. House Joint Resolution 1001 by Representative Garnett, also Senator Pember, concerning the joint session of the House of Representatives and the Senate of the 72nd General Assembly for the purpose of canvassing the votes for the certain officials at the election held on November 6th, 2018. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the rules be suspended and that SHJR 1001 be given immediate consideration. The question before the House is to suspend the rules for immediate consideration of HJR 1001. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The motion is passed. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that HJR 1001 be adopted. The question before the House is the adoption of HJR 1001. All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. HJR 1001 is adopted. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that a committee of three be appointed to notify the Senate that the House is organized and ready for business. Woo. Seeing no objection to the motion, Representatives Bridges, Cutter, and Beckman will notify the Senate that the House is organized and ready for business. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that a committee of three be appointed to notify the governor that the House is organized and ready for business. Seeing no objection to the motion, Representatives Singer, Galindo, and Humphrey will notify the governor that the House is organized and ready for business. At this time, the committees to notify the Senate and the governor will be excused to briefly proceed to the Senate and to the office of the governor. The House will stand in a brief recess until the House committee returns.
Rodriguez and Senator Lundin. Um, and we are here to announce that we in the Senate are organized and ready for business. I understand that this is generally a raucous and rowdy bunch over here, but, <laughs> but my few minutes here, um, you know, sort of dispels that. You're pretty calm and tame at the moment, but you are a bit behind. We've been ready and organized for a while, and we're ready to get on with things, so I'm glad you guys are finally um, up to the same speed. So thanks so much, and I uh, look forward to working with you. Senator Lundeen and Senator Rodriguez. <laughs> Good morning, House. Uh, I second my cohort from Jefferson County. Uh, it's been about 15 minutes. We've been waiting. We're ready to start business, so let's get some work done. Senator Lundeen. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be back in this chamber that you, as many of you know, I love so dearly. It's an honor to be in front of so many past speakers. Thank you for your service. Um, I do not know what happened today. In fact, apparently the Senate shook off its torpor. I don't know whether it's my presence there or what, but we were, in fact, organized and prepared to do the business of the people of Colorado some time ago. And I'm glad to see the House is now joining us in that effort. It is a pleasure to be back here in the House. Please continue to serve with the beauty and honor that I know you all care to do. Enjoy the House. It may, in fact, Jury's still out. It may, in fact, be the upper chamber. <laughs> Thank you, Senators. We know that nap time starts around 1 o'clock in the Senate, so we'll let you go. for our committee uh, to return, so we will uh, remain in a brief recess.
House will come back to order. The governor was asleep. The governor is an island. <laughs> Representative Bridges, where did he go? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe another member of our delegation to the Senate has something to share. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Bridges. The Senate has been notified that the House is ready for business, and most of them were even awake to hear it. <laughs> thank you, Representative Cutter. Uh, Representative Beckman? No, okay. It looks like the House and Senate are eager to begin work uh, for the state of Colorado. So is the committee, to, the committee to notify the governor has returned? Representative Singer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We have uh, notified the governor that the House is organized and ready for business and following the governor and governor-elect's laughter I will comment that it was nervous laughter. <laughs> they told us to remember to keep our word to our constituents and move Colorado forward. And yes, William, we're going to think about our kids every day. Representatives Galindo and Humphrey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Wow, it's official, huh? Um, Yes, so uh, the governor-elect uh, and the governor were having a great time uh, looking at the uh, departing governor's pictures today, so um, it should be an awesome session, and they were pretty excited. So let's get to work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a pleasure to go up there and, and uh, be able to say goodbye to Governor Hickenlooper and um, get to meet. I, I didn't mean it in that way. And and and. <laughs> And get to meet the governor-elect. Um, I asked about their preferences on the Broncos uh, coach, and I didn't really get any strong answers on that. But you know, they're they're politicians. Thank you, committee. Mr. Randall, please read the list of appointments to committees. House committees, committee on appropriations. Representatives Hansen, Chair, Escar, Vice Chair. Bird, Bockenfeld, Coleman, Kennedy, Kraftharp, McCluskey, Pelton, Rankin, and Rich. Committee on Business Affairs and Labor. Representatives Kraftharp, Chair, Coleman, Vice Chair, Arndt, Bird, Duran, McKean, Sandridge, Snyder, Sullivan, Van Winkle, Williams. Committee on Education. Representatives McLaughlin, Chair, Buenteo, Vice Chair, Baisley, Buckner, Coleman, Cutter, Exum, Geithner, Larson, McCluskey, Michelson, Janae, Wilson. Committee on Energy and Environment. Representatives Jackson, Chair, Hooten, Vice Chair, Bridges, Geithner, Janal, Landgraf, Liston, Sane, Sirota, Valdez A., Weissman. Committee on Finance. Representatives Harrod, Chair, Tipper, Vice Chair, Beckman, Bockenfeld, Benavides, Bird, Gray, Sandridge, Snyder, Sullivan, Rich. Committee on Health and Insurance, Representatives Lantine, Chair, Caraveo, Vice Chair, Baisley, Beckman, Buckner, Catlin, Janal, Jackson, Mullica, Soper, Tatone. Committee on Judiciary, Representatives Weissman, Chair, Herod, Vice Chair, Benavides, Bockenfeld, Carver, Galindo, Gonzalez Gutierrez, McKean, Roberts, Soper, Tipper. Committee on Public Health Care and Human Services, Representative Singer, Chair, Michelson Janay, Vice Chair, Caraveo, Cutter, Gonzalez Gutierrez, Jaquez Lewis, Landgraf, Larson, Liston, Molica, Pelton. Committee on Rural Affairs, Representatives Roberts, Chair, Valdez D, Vice Chair, Arndt, Buck, Buenteo, Catlin, McCluskey, McLaughlin, Lewis, Pelton, Tatone. Committee on State Veterans and Military Affairs, Representatives Kennedy, Chair, Jaquez Lewis, Vice Chair, 
Duran, Humphrey, Lantin, Melton, Rich, Sirota, Williams. Committee on Transportation and Local Government, Representatives Gray, Chair, Exum, Vice Chair, Bridges, Carver, Galindo, Hooten, Humphrey, Lewis, Ransom, Valdez A, Valdez D. Committee on House Services, Representatives Buckner, Chair, Escar, McKean, Van Winkle. Joint Legislative Committees, Committee on Capital Development, Representative Roberts, Chair, Beckman, Valdez A. Committee on Executive Committee, the Executive Committee of Legislative Council, Representatives Casey Becker, Vice Chair Garnett, Neville. Committee, the Joint Budget Committee, Representatives Escar, Vice Chair, Hansen, Rankin. Committee on Legal Services, Representatives Harrod, Snyder, Soper, Van Winkle, Weissman. Committee on Legislative Audit, Representatives Kraftarp, Michelson Janay, Ransom, Sane. And Committee on Legislative Council, Representatives Casey Becker, Vice Chair, Duran, Garnett, Jackson, Lantine, Molica, Neville, Sane, Van Winkle. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the appointments to the Legislative Audit Committee be confirmed. Pursuant to 2-3-101, Colorado Revised Statutes, the appointments to the Legislative Audit Committee requires a recorded vote. Mr. Randall, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representatives Buenteo, Melton, Molica. Okay, here. Representative Mollica just had a baby and I believe uh, stepped away, so Representative Mollica is, ex uh, is excused. Mr. Randall, please close the machine. Oh. With 63 aye votes, one excused and one vacant, the appointments for the Legislative Audit, Co Audit Committee have been confirmed. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the appointments to the Legislative Council Committee be confirmed. Pursuant to 2-3-301 Colorado Revised Statutes, the appointments to the Legislative Council Committee requires a recorded vote. Mr. Randall, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representatives, that last vote was your free pass. From here on in, there will be fines for, for missed votes. <laughs> Mr. Randall, please clo uh, close the machine. With 63 aye votes, one excused and one vacant, the appointments for the Legislative Council Committee are confirmed. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the appointments to the Committee on Legal Services be confirmed. Pursuant to 2-3-502 Colorado Revised Statutes, the appointments to the Committee on Legal Services requires a recorded vote. Mr. Randall, please open the machine and members proceed to vote.
Mr. Randall, please close the machine. Oh. <laughs> With 63 aye votes, one excused, and one vacant, the appointments to the Committee on Legal Services are confirmed. At this time, Minority, Need Minority Leader Neville and I are going to address the body. <clears throat> Thank you, members. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to your state capitol. It is one of my greatest honors to stand before you today. I want to thank the constituents of my district, which stretches from the Wyoming border in the north to Mount Evans in the south, from Boulder to Kremlin, from Jackson, Grand, and Gilpin counties to Clear Creek and Boulder counties. It's an honor to represent you. Thank you to Majority Leader Garnett and to our entire leadership team who will help lead our chamber over the next two years you all are awesome. Minority Leader Neville, congratulations on being selected to lead your caucus once again, and I hope to work together with you to serve the people of our great state. I would also like to congratulate Representative Kyle Malika and his family who welcomed the birth of a new baby girl, Autumn Grace, this week. I look around this chamber and I see many new faces and a lot more Democrats. <laughs> I'd like to welcome our first years and returning legislators. No matter your party, we are all here because we want Coloradans to succeed. Running for office or stepping forward to participate in public service is never easy. So on behalf of this chamber and our state, I extend thanks to you and your families and friends who have agreed to let us borrow you for the next two years. Your support is the key to our success. Together, we are driven to build a fair economy that expands opportunity for all to invest in our future and to protect the Colorado way of life. Today, we open the first regular session of the 72nd General Assembly. Members, Pack your energy and ideas with you every day because you're about to have some of the longest days wrapped into the shortest four months you'll ever know. Your patience will be tested, your sleep will shorten, your family will miss you, and your waistline may grow. But believe me, the future is worth the fight and your efforts are worthwhile. This year, Coloradans made history by electing the first Jewish and openly, openly gay governor. We made history by electing a record number of people of color to our state legislature. We made history by electing 33 women, a majority, to the House. In This includes 25 women in the Democratic House Caucus alone and the first transgender representative in, the state, in our state history. <laughs> when 
Whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or unaffiliated voter, I think we can all agree that this chamber is sending a strong message that when people participate in democracy, their government is more reflective of their state's diverse background and ideas. It's our shared hope that the number of women and people of color who are motivated to step forward and run for office will inspire the next generation of Coloradans to pursue public service and become more involved. I am honored to accept this gavel and look forward to working with you all. Now, I've watched a few of my predecessors break a few gavels to try to keep this chamber in order. So let's hope this is the only gavel I need. But Marilyn, based on past experience, please have a backup ready. <laughs> it's not lost on me that I'm the third consecutive woman to serve as speaker and the fourth in our state's rich history. <laughs> Standing before you today, I know I won't be the last. Thank you to the past speakers in attendance, including Lola Spradley, Doug Dean, Frank McNulty, Chrysanta Duran, Dickie Lee Hollinghorst, and Mark Ferrandino, who was here, if he's still here. I would also be remiss if I didn't thank all the other elected officials who've blazed a trail ahead of us. That includes, if they're still here, uh, Boulder County Commissioners Cindy Domenico, Deb Gardner, Elise Jones, new CU Regent Leslie Smith, Lafayette City Council Member Jamie Harkins, and elected officials Alice Madden, Claire Levy, Lieutenant Governor Garcia, Raleigh and Josie Heath, Will Tor, former Senate Minority Leader Ruth Wright, former Congressman and Minority Leader, uh, uh, House Minority Leader David Skaggs, Todd Solomon, Beth McCann, Wellington Webb, Mayor Wellington Webb, Representative Wilma Webb, Max Tyler, and Dan Pabone. Thank all of you for your service. I also want to acknowledge my father-in-law, and sister-in-law, Ed and Sean Monet Kunkel. Thanks for being here today. And I want to thank my parents who couldn't be here today. And I'm grateful for the care and love they gave to me and all my siblings, three, <laughs> three of whom are here with me today, Karen, Casey, Elle Becker, and Alicia Ewing. One of the things I'm most grateful for is that my parents decided to let me spend my summers as a teenager in the Rockies. I was a Florida girl discovering the vast and transformative place that is the West. Until then, I had never seen mountains, and I'd never seen snow. Actually, it was hailing when I screamed, oh my God, snow, and my now lifelong friend who lives in Denver turned to me with a smirk on her face and said, you dummy, it's hail. I truly fell in love with the West and I feel lucky to call Colorado home. My husband Miles and I have built our lives and family in Boulder and I'm thankful for the love and support of Miles and our two boys, Leo and Ryder. <laughs> 11 years ago, Leo had just been born. He was seven weeks old when the market tanked and I was laid off from my job. I think about how much has changed in those 11 years. I certainly had no idea that I was going to run for local office then or that I would end up standing here in front of you as speaker. But a lot more has changed since Leo was born. Back then, Amazon was a fledgling company. There was no Bitcoin, no Lyft, 
no icon pass, no marijuana storefronts, no negative factor, no Affordable Care Act. And Representative Rochelle Galindo was still in high school. <laughs> 11 years ago, there were only 36 women serving in the House and Senate combined in Colorado. Each year brings new issues to us at the Capitol, but the more things change, the more they stay the same. We've gone from a deep recession over those years to a thriving state, but the advantage of Colorado's growth and economic prosperity of the last five or six years hasn't been felt by every corner of our state. Unemployment statewide is low, and the president might be tweeting about the market, at least when it's up, but many of our neighbors still find it hard to get ahead, and they struggle with the rising cost of living. Hardworking families are trying to save for years down the road, or even just the coming month and they're often one tragedy or paycheck away from financial distress. That means we need to give them the tools they need to get ahead. Last session, we passed bills to help Coloradans with the high cost of childcare, increase the construction of affordable housing, and connect more Coloradans to the good, high-paying jobs our economy is now producing in great numbers. But it's not enough. We are a state built on the value of people who work hard, and they should be treated fairly. That means pass, finally passing paid family leave because no one should have to risk. <laughs> because no one should have to risk financial ruin or lose their job to care for a new child or sick relative. It also means that women and people of color should be paid equally for equal work. We are committed to fighting for every Coloradan to be treated with dignity, fairness, and the respect they deserve. Despite significant efforts from legislators on both sides of the aisle, the rural-urban divide continues to be a challenge. While Colorado's economy is working for some, it's not working for everyone in rural communities, and the legislature must do more to ensure that our success touches all parts of our state. That means taking steps in rural Colorado to reduce the cost of health care and kickstart more economic development to get more people into good-paying jobs. We must keep building on the bipartisan success of workforce development programs in communities across the state. Access to affordable housing continues to be out of reach for many people. That means we need to invest state dollars in our affordable housing trust fund. It is my hope and the hope of many in this chamber that we work together to problem solve and expand opportunity. But we're also committed to protecting the Colorado way of life. And I can't think of a more challenge, a more important challenge, a more important for challenge for us to take on than climate change. <laughs> climate change is real and it's threatening our thriving outdoor economy and our livelihoods. Skiers are seeing smaller snowpacks, rafters are seeing smaller rapids, anglers are sh seeing shallower waters, mountain residents are seeing more frequent and more destructive wildfires, and our eastern plains are seeing more drought. And unfortunately, Washington has once again chosen to bury its head in the sand while states and the rest of the world work to address the threat of climate change. We will build a future by expanding our commitment to renewable energy, giving local communities the tools they need to prepare for the impacts of climate change, and creating strong goals to limit carbon pollution. Our recent economic success shows that we can work together to protect our clean air and water and grow our economy at the same time. It's also a point of pride in our state that the leading solutions and studies to this challenge are co coming from Colorado's institutions of higher education and innovative entrepreneur entrepreneurs in Colorado. We need to continue Colorado's climate leadership for the sake of our economy, 
public health, and clean air. Colorado's way of life is also threatened by the growing conflict between neighbors and oil and gas. Our state, our state has grown and schools and neighborhoods are butting up against oil and gas operations. It's time we update our laws to reflect this new paradigm. That means we must ensure communities feel more confidence that the oil and gas happening nearby isn't negatively impacting their air and water quality or their quality of life. Colorado's way of life is precious. It's part of the reason people live, work, and play, and move here, like I did so many years ago. As we think about Colorado's way of life, we must also think about investing in our future. Many of our own educators are having to work multiple jobs just to pay their own bills. And many students have never had the experience of being in a fully funded school system. We've recently passed bipartisan state budgets that invested hundreds of millions of new dollars into our schools. We've boosted per pupil funding and made commitments to address the teacher shortage. And we've brought down the negative factor. But if we intend to leave our state in a better position than we found it, we must do more. We need to give our students, teachers, and schools the tools they need to succeed. That means we must continue to invest in early childhood education, K-12, and higher ed. And it means we should make... Colorados are tired over the lack of investment in roads, bridges, and transit. That means coming up with creative and collaborative solutions to our transportation problems. <laughs> Coloradans, no matter their political affiliation or zip code, are fed up with the high cost of health care and out of control prescription drug prices. We hear from Coloradans every day who talk about their struggles with health care. We share the concerns of families and seniors across the state who agonize over access and rising costs. In the absence of federal leadership in Washington, we at the Capitol must address this challenge state on. That means we must work together to address skyrocketing health care costs by promoting transparency in insurance drug pricing, and medical expenses. And it also means we must tackle surprise billing and help provide more stability to our health insurance markets. <laughs> the health and well-being of Coloradans must continue to be a top priority because we're facing a public health epidemic. The opioid epidemic in the United States has claimed more lives than the entire Vietnam War. During the last session, we passed bills to help battle this epidemic by getting people the care and treatment they need and addressing, addressing prescribing practices. These bipartisan measures are a good start, but there's more, much more work to be done to end the stigma around addiction and recovery. That means we must work together to save lives and end this epidemic. There's another epidemic we must address, gun violence. Our state, our children, our families, even those who are now represented in this chamber have personally been impacted by this crisis. Coloradans are tired of living with the consequences of inaction. They are marching in the streets and taking to the halls of this building, and they are demanding action on gun sense legislation. That means we will work to pass the life-saving extreme risk protection order bill to prevent tragedies before they happen.
Over the past few years, we've made significant bipartisan strides towards reforming our broken criminal justice system. We are even seeing consensus at the federal level on this issue. So it's my hope that this is an area where we can, conti we can continue to find common ground. We've come a long way from when we were labeled the hate state. Last session, we were able to preserve a strong Colorado Civil Rights Division, and we're, we've also made important progress for our LGBTQ community in recent years, but there's still more work to be done to ensure we have a more inclusive and fair Colorado. That means instead of building walls and barriers that seek to sow division and block progress, we will build bridges and partnerships that will power our people and state forward. Last session, we worked to address the culture at the Capitol. The Capitol must be a place where everyone feels safe and respected, and that means we will continue to focus on reforming the culture and work together, regardless of party, to implement necessary changes this session. So now it's time to work together Coloradans cast their votes for those who will fight to expand opportunity for all and to govern responsibly. Coloradans chose compassion and opportunity over cruelty and chaos. They want leaders who will stand for something, not against everything. They want a government that will fight for the people, not special interests. We must continue to reach across the aisle and not be afraid to find those sweet spots that reflect the Colorado way. This is a new and diverse group of lawmakers who will all bring influential ideas and renewed energy to this chamber, and it's on all of us to problem solve for the next 120 days. I'm honored to serve as your speaker and a speaker for all Coloradans. I'm excited about what we can accomplish together in order to protect the Colorado way of life. Thank you, God bless the state of Colorado, and let's get to work. I recognize Minority Leader Neville for the purpose of addressing the House. Lower us down for the vertically challenged here. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, um, and congratulations. On a day like this, it's right to be thankful. Yes, even in the minority, I'm still thankful. I'm thankful for our state and nation. I'm thankful for our families and loved ones, especially my awesome, lovely wife who just shines up this chamber. It's so great to see her here, so thank you, honey. I'm thankful for God's providence in bringing us here to represent the people of Colorado. I welcome you and congratulate you all on your hard-earned electoral victories. Madam Speaker, and I disagree on many issues, but I have always appreciated her candor and respect for this place and the work we do here. I look forward to working with you, Madam Speaker. Perhaps this is the place to comment on politics more broadly. Some people in our country don't want, to talk, want us to talk, debate, or build relationships. They invoke labels like racist or un-American and the like to shut down conversations. This is a disturbing trend in American politics and society. But Professor Jonathan Haidt has said this trend, this reversion to tribes and safe spaces can be overcome with conversations and relationships, that is, with good old American civil discourse. To be tolerant means to put up with and listen to people we disagree with. Many people in this room wore the uniform of our country to preserve our fundamental right to free speech and debate, a right the law and constitution clearly afford to disagreeable 
and even intolerant people, we should shun and shame those who would try to deny us this most basic right. Because in the end, such people want to make conversation, comedy, and relationships in this place impossible. In my experience, we've generally been very good at civility in the Colorado General Assembly. Anyone who's read the annual digest of bills will see that almost every bill that's become law in the past two years has had bipartisan support. Yet now, with a Democrat governor and Senate, the House majority no longer needs bipartisan support. But history and wisdom would suggest Coloradans will benefit from it. Some might assume that the main job of the minority party is to obstruct the majority. But that's not my view. Let me explain. We are committed to the principles of smaller government and free enterprise. These commitments don't spring from our loyalty to an old book or a bumper sticker. They come from our observations about how individual governments and markets have functioned best throughout human history. They are people-centered because they work for people. Our commitment to smaller government comes from the realization that people make mistakes. People are fallible. People can be tempted. That's true whether they are educated or ambitious or both or neither. We don't want to give those in government too much power to interfere with our lives because they're as prone to mistakes and temptations as the rest of us. As to our commitment to free enterprise, well, that comes from our experience as a nation. In 230 years, we have become the most powerful and prosperous country on Earth. Neither the microwave oven, nor the iPhone, nor the light bulb was conceived by a government bureaucracy or a top-down approach to the economy. Instead, these hundreds of other important inventions originated in the imagination of Americans who were free to dream and build. Because our economic system provides opportunities for creators, and visionaries while taking into account a realistic view of human nature, it offers a better life for moms and dads, for leaders and laborers, the daughters of the revolution, and the sons of immigrants. Our success hasn't come by having a large government, but by having large freedoms that enable individuals to pursue their dreams and happiness. The latest Colorado economic forecast was delivered to our office recently. Like last year, we have $1 billion more than anticipated. That's but one feature of the economic revival that's come via our party's leadership in Washington. But there are others. Unemployment is at an all-time low, especially and in including the minority community. The economy's added 4.8 million jobs since November of 2016. Small business and consumer optimism remain near their all-time highs. And the GDP reflects strong and sustained growth. You see, when Americans are free from unnecessary regulation and overtaxation, they prosper. We want a government that provides security and justice, but mostly we want to be left alone in our pursuit of happiness. Here at the Capitol, when Republicans find policies that are consistent with the lessons of history, we advocate for them. When public policy ignores these realities, we oppose it because we want policy that works for people. We want a better life and a better future for everyone. For example, if the majority party insists on passing an expensive and involuntary family leave program that will cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars, one that is ripe for abuse and damaging to business, we'll oppose it because we know, and history teaches, that such a program will cost more than planned and be less efficient than planned, even as it makes Colorado less affordable for single moms, working families, and young people joining the workforce. Similarly, this past November, Colorado said no to increased regulation of the oil and gas industry. And no wonder. We already have safeguards in place. We already enjoy lots of industry agency cooperation. And people understand the critical role played by the industry in providing jobs, health care, and a future for them and their families. Taxes paid by this well-regulated industry funds teachers, troopers, and transportation. Increased regulation would not only contradict voters' expressed will, it would also make Colorado less affordable, and thus hurt everyone. And that's why we will oppose it should it be proposed. The Denver Post recently published the results of a poll they'd conducted with millennials. Being a millennial myself, I was interested in what they had to say. The gist of the story was this. 
Young professionals in Colorado are waiting to have children because they can't afford them. The same holds true for their dream of owning a home. Single moms, working women, and families in general groan under the burden of health care costs. Some of these costs are artificial because people are forced to buy coverage they neither need nor want, while others struggle with a system that lacks transparency and competition. We must develop and insist on a creative market-based solution that will work as opposed to a big government solution that won't. We must ensure transparent pricing, more consumer choice, and voluntary participation. It's not fair or compassionate when people are hurt by politicians who promise progress but deliver price increases. Similarly, investing in transportation, that is in roads and bridges, will improve our quality of life. It will cut down on commute times, make living outside cities more accessible and affordable, and it can be done by spending money we already have. 97% of commuters use roads and bridges, and that's where we should invest our transportation dollars. There's no reason a significant portion of our budget can't be spent on transportation, especially at a time when our coffers are overflowing. Coloradans told us this past November they don't want taxes raised to pay for transportation projects we already have money for. On a related note, Coloradans can't afford to pay thousands of dollars more for vehicles they use to work, take children to school, and vacation. But new environmental regulations will raise the price of both old and new cars. As surely as day follows night, these regulations will raise the prices as they do little to improve our environment. The drip, drip, drip of paying for basic needs is draining Coloradans of the optimism and hope that should be natural to residents of this great state. It causes others to leave and yet others to delay having children. The bills we debate this session will directly impact Colorado's affordability. And if history teaches us anything, it teaches us that big government programs bring with them the very expensive baggage of unintended consequences. Sadly, this baggage is relevant to the debate about injection sites. Some well-intentioned people would have you believe that this is a compassionate approach to a complicated problem. Fact is, the causes of opioid addiction are often complicated. Yet Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein has pointed out that such sites violate federal law, and more importantly, they create serious safety risks for workers, neighborhoods, as, even as they normalize self-destructive behavior. So-called safe injection sites are not the answer. Asking for the taxpayers to foot the bill to continue addiction is a bad idea. Subsidizing the slow motion suicide of our citizens is wrong. We must and can do better. When it comes to education, the founders of our state thought it so important that they required it to be publicly funded. Over the past several years, we've funded a lot. But when you spend or invest money, it's only fair to expect some return. We've made great financial investment, but we're not getting a great return, especially in the minority community. According to the Department of Education, local school districts receive on average slightly more than 15,000 per child. An average class of 23 students costs taxpayers about $345,000 per year. If those students began first grade together, taxpayers would have invested over $4.1 million in them by the time they graduate high school. Yet according to the Department of Education's own data, 21% of those students won't graduate, and nearly 40% of those that do are unprepared to take a freshman class in college and must instead take remedial courses in math and English. Minority fourth grade student math success doesn't even reach 19%. That is, over 80% don't even meet expectations. 79% of African American and 71% of Hispanic graduates need remediation before starting college. In a room where the likeness of Barney Ford is featured, we should demand better. Yet, with far less money, a more diverse student population, and far fewer resources, charter schools do better. In the past year, in the past eight years, Colorado student enrollment has increased by 7%. The number of teachers employed has increased by 10%. But the number of principals and assistant principals has gone up by 24%. What can we do? 
We can get rid of costly state rules that force schools to hire administrators instead of teachers. We can ask schools to refocus their efforts on academics and job training, and don't ask them to do so many other things. Encourage districts to offer better pay for better teachers. Make it easier to remove bad teachers. Offer more educational choices for students and parents. Like in every other market, be it cell phones, cable TV, or automobiles, competition and consumer choice result in better product products and more value for money. The same can happen for education. Children deserve hope, but our status quo system robs them of it. The time has come for us to have an open mind to new approaches to education because it is obvious that what we've been doing isn't working. We will work with Democrats on any bill that offers real hope for educational success. Before Colorado was a state, it was a frontier. And that frontier spirit produced a constitution that mandated education spending. That same constitution made the right of gun ownership and self-defense explicit. Nevertheless, when killers use guns, some people advocate curtailing those rights. The fact is, since 1993, our population has increased 27%. The number of firearms in the country has increased 56%. Yet the number of gun homicides per 100,000 has been nearly cut in half from 7 to 3.6. New laws designed to prevent mentally ill from acquiring firearms are so badly written and open to abuse, they are more likely to rob the innocent of the ability to defend themselves than prevent the mentally ill from killing. While we are, pre we are prepared to look closely at such bills, we are not willing to leave the innocent defenseless so that we might feel good about ourselves. The Second Amendment and other constitutional rights define this nation and our state. We have the right to free speech, the right to freely exercise our religion, but above all, we have the right to life. Without it, liberty and the pursuit of happiness are empty slogans. Americans are increasingly pro-life, in no small measure because of inv inventions like the sonogram that enables us to view the development of our unborn babies. That's where I first saw my three daughters, and many of us here have had the same experience I pray this enlightened attitude makes, it what, makes its way to the Capitol. In conclusion, we have choices to make. Will we expand state government at the expense of average citizens? Or look for ways to lower the cost of doing business in Colorado to make Colorado more affordable? Will we plant fiscal bombs into the budget in the form of costly new programs? burdening us and our children for decades, or develop more free enterprise-oriented solutions. The bigger government approach doesn't work. It creates more inequality, more dependence, and more social division. And if you doubt me on this, just look to the West, where California now has the highest rate of poverty in the nation. Or look to Illinois, which is on the verge of bankruptcy. I look forward to working with colleagues on both sides of the aisle, to make Colorado more affordable for working families and individuals, more hospitable for business, and more respectful and tolerant of the constitutional rights and liberties of all of our citizens. Thank you, and God bless. Majority Leader Garnett. Is this where I get to give my speech? <laughs> <laughs> um, just joking. Madam Speaker, I move that the remarks of the Speaker and Minority Leader be printed in the journal. Seeing no objection, the remarks will be printed in the journal. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House stand in recess until after the joint session. If there's no objection, the House will be in recess until after the joint session. And, and so members, we will wait for the Senate to join us in a joint session. I know, they're probably taking their nap, but <laughs> someone can go fire up an alarm clock or something and get them awake. Uh, <laughs> but they'll be over shortly and uh, we'll proceed.
Members, please be seated. Members, we have more business to conduct. I'm just trying to. Oh, okay. Go ahead and gavel again. Speaker, which one would you like? Members, members, take your seats. If you are a state senator, sit next to a state representative. The faster we organize, the faster we move, the faster you get to go celebrate with friends and family. Yes, ma'am. Great. Members, please be seated. Majority Leader Fenberg. Fenberg. Oh. The joint session will now come to order. Okay, we can do that. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 3 of the Colorado State Constitution, a joint session shall be convened in order for the General Assembly to declare who shall be the duly elected state officials. Senate Majority Leader Fenberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I move that the morning roll call of the Senate be made the Senate roll call of the joint session. If there's no objection, the morning roll call of the Senate will be made at this, will be made the Senate roll call for the joint session. House Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I move that the morning roll call of the House be made the House roll call of the joint session. If there's no objection, the morning roll call of the House will be made the House roll call for the joint session. A quorum is present. As is customary, it is my privilege and honor to present this gavel to the President of the Senate with the request that he preside over the proceedings. But before he does, I missed a few elected representatives earlier, and I want to uh, recognize uh, former State Representative Ed V. Hill, Val V. Hill. Val V. Hill, Fran Coleman, and Dave Young. So my apologies for missing you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will Mr. Randall please read the communications from the Secretary of State? State of Colorado, Department of State. I, Wayne W. Williams, Secretary of State of the State of Colorado, certify that I have canvassed the abstract of votes cast submitted in the State of Colorado and do state that, to the best of my knowledge and belief, the attached list represents the total votes cast for the executive state offices by the qualified electors of the State of Colorado in the November 6, 2018 general election. In testimony whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the great seal of the State of Colorado at the City of Denver this 11th day of December, 2018. Signed, Wayne W. Williams, Secretary of State. State of Colorado, Department of State. I, Wayne W. Williams, Secretary of State of the State of Colorado, certify that I have canvassed the abstract of votes cast submitted in the State of Colorado and do state that to the best of my knowledge and belief, the persons listed on this attached list were duly elected to the executive state offices by the qualified electors of the State of Colorado in the November 6, 2018 general election. In testimony whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the great seal of the State of Colorado at the City of Denver this 11th day of December, 2018. Signed, Wayne W. Williams, Secretary of State. Governor, Jared Polis. Lieutenant Governor, Diane Primavera. Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold. State Treasurer, Dave Young. Attorney General, Phil Weiser.
I uh, do hereby declare that upon examination of the abstract of the votes cast in the November 4th, 2008 general election for the executive officers of the state of Colorado, the following named persons having the highest number of votes are hereby elected to the following offices. Governor, Jared Polis, Democrat. Lieutenant Governor, Diane Prima Primavera, Democrat. Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold, Democrat. Treasurer, Dave Young, Democrat. Attorney General, Phil Weiser, Democrat. Representative Garnett. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the communications from the Secretary of State be printed in the House Journal. The motion is the communications from the Secretary of State be printed in the House Journal. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion carries. The election results from the Secretary of State will be printed in the House Journal. Senator Fenberg, Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the joint session be dissolved. The motion is that the joint session be dissolved. Any discussion? Being none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the motion carries and the joint session is dissolved. All right, good job. Congratulations. See you on Monday. Members, the House will come back to order. We have a little bit more business. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this part will go fast, I promise. Majority Leader Garnett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I am about to make a motion to recess until later today, at which time the Speaker will introduce the first round of bills. There is no need for you to return to the chamber. You are free to go. Thank you. I move the House stand in recess until uh, later today. After introduction of bills this afternoon, the House will be in adjournment until Monday morning at 10 a.m. When there will be more business to conduct, please enjoy the rest of the day with your families. Thank you. And at this time, seeing no objection, the House will stand in recess until later today. Later today.